Okay, hello, hello, hello. Is that working? Good. All right. All right, everyone. Okay, everybody, hello, is this on? Microphone check, there we go. All right, everyone, let's make our way to the seats, um, or at the very least, just stop talking. <laughs> just kidding, sort of, sort of kidding. Um, today's the first day of our Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you wanna walk by and see what's called our atrium, which I don't, they call it that, it's the little worship space for the little kids. It's really wonderful what Amy and uh, Jacob have done in our, um, intrepid uh, buildings and ground people, uh, I mean, um, physical plant people have done. They turned the library, which we do still have a library, just so you know, we've just moved it to the M&M building to actually a much more beautiful room. There's wall to floor to ceiling windows and uh, chairs. And so if you'd like to, um, well, if you've heard the sermon already, if you'd like to avail yourself of any and all resources that I have in my library and go read them in that room, you're more than welcome. That being said, I just, I'm just going to weekly give books away. I just have these in my office. This one is called The Case for the Creator by Lee, uh, by Lee Strobel. You may be familiar with The Case for Christ. If you're not, you're going to be, or, or we're going to help you there. You could start with Case for Christ. There's Case for Faith, and there's Case for the Creator. So this would be a wonderful little primer for our Genesis Bible study. And so I'll just leave this up here. You're welcome to have it, um, but you have to promise to at least read in it. It's kind of long, so you don't have to read the whole thing. But if you read in it, and then you're edified, and then you can give it to someone else or give it back to me, and I'll give it to someone else, okay? That's my, that's my pledge to you. Um, what have I not done? I've not turned on. You're still looking at whatever this is, right? This um. We just got one of those. So, Liza, for my birthday and our anniversary, we got ourselves one of those frame TVs. Have you seen those? Super cool. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I recommend it. Um, now it's not like just a giant black hole in our living room. It's like different art. Um, I'm just talking as I'm doing this. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was my little advertisement for you. Case for the Creator. I've only read in it, I must admit. I've not read the whole thing, but um, that was because I found some of it I already knew. So, um, but you may, need, you may need to read the whole thing, which is fine. Um, isn't that cute? That's cute. That's just cute overload. Okay, let's pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, um, I uh, just continue to advertise. I mean, it's a little preempt preemptive, I think, but I'm hoping you'll come, but we have solidified the speakers. Um, and we are, are putting together the, uh, the, 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 the sort of schedule, but it's going, it promises to be this conference that we're having in February on what it means to be a human being, ourselves, our souls, and bodies. It's really been very edifying to me, the number of people when I, to whom I've been speaking and talking about what we're, what we're talking about, what we're dealing with, and they say, my gosh, that's exactly what uh, the type questions that we are wrestling with ourselves those are the type of uh, concerns that we have, and gosh, I wish I could come. And I'm like, well, what's stopping you? You know, Hilton Head in February is better than, you know, Anchorage, for instance, you know, or wherever you're coming from in the middle. Of, like, uh, definitely better than Ambridge. I mean, no offense, Brian. Brian doesn't watch this. But anyone living in Ambridge, that's Pennsylvania. Um, but why do I say that? It's because the, um, you'll, see, you'll hear an urgency if you heard the sermon already. Um, and I'm, uh, in, in my 
well, preaching, that's what I do, but, um, but it's in, in really in, in many different areas of my life, um, and I'm not alone in this. I mean, I know I can speak for Kelly and Jacob, but I can also now having, um, you know, having a network of, of clergy, both um, Anglican and not, you know, I have a lot of Baptist friends, a lot of Presbyterian friends, a lot of Lutheran friends, um, and I'm grateful for the, the, the fact that those who are friends w- of mine, uh, we have been sort of similarly... Um, inspired, I think is, is the word, um, by the Lord uh, to not give up the ship when it comes to the church. You know, he might be heartened to hear this, but there are people who think that, um, well, it's just a matter of course that they're used, people used to believe and go to church and now they don't. You know, people used to be spiritual and now they're religious, or used to be religious, now they're spiritual, and that's just going to be the way it is in my family. That's just the way it is with my grandkids, and people have given up. And I'm here to at least implore you not to. You are not the problem because you're here. But many people have just simply given up. And, you know, and they look um, and sort of roll over. And the problem with that is twofold. One, the argument for just rolling over is like, well, you know, um, sort of a nihilistic, uh, you know, um, all roads lead to heaven. Who can really say what truth is? Um, you know, who am I to judge, all of these sort of aphorisms people throw up as they are being um, uh, sort of sliding deeper into nihilistic despair. And this is what's happening. There's a purpose for this. And, um, you know, nihilistic despair can take the place, can look like um, anger and self-destruction. You know, that's what rock music in many ways is about, you know, like like the Swedish death metal, for instance. You know, like um, if you go listen to, uh, you know, 19, 18, 19 year old Pantera, you know, like when they're angry at the world and, you know, the old early Beastie Boys, you know, there's a certain anger there. But uh, nihilistic despair can also just look like um, numbing yourself to death and, uh, and, and just sort of, well, playing golf. And I love golf, don't get me wrong, but I mean, that, can, that nihilistic despair can be, can be um, uh, hidden by all sorts of sort of weak smiles, right? And I think it's actually, and I love football, don't get me wrong, I played football in college. I watched LSU's dramatic, d- dramatic victory over USC yesterday. I watched all this, you know. Um, but the level of energy and joy and, frankly, life purpose people get from following some of these football teams is, is, is it's, 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 I use this in a very technical term, pathetic, um, with pathos. Like, that. I mean that in a, I don't mean that in, a, in any, any sort of contemptuous way, but I look at people and I say, well, goodness gracious, if, if that's the level of commitment you have to a football team, well, that is, that is carrying way too much weight in your life than, than something like that can. Not that it even should, but it cannot carry that because you are ignoring some larger questions of life if you are able to um, silence them by the, um, you know, the, 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 the golden band from Tigerland, as we would say in Baton Rouge, you know? Dun, dun, dun. I mean, when that comes on, you know, people's lives are changed, you know? And it's like, well, um, let's talk, <laughs> you know, let's talk. At any rate, so uh, why do I bring all that up? Um, well, I got it in part. I want to commend this talk with you. If you don't listen to Al Mohler, you should consider it. Uh, he's a Baptist, you know, and, and he's, you know, I mean, we wouldn't agree on everything, but he's a, he's a hero. You know, I was preaching about today the people that, have, that are, you know, uh, someone mentioned it, you know, it's like a, if you can look back 10 years of your life and you could tell someone, you know, here's some of the roadblocks, here's some of the turns, here's some of the twists, you know, and then you can, if you've got someone 20 years ahead of you that can tell that person to tell you, I mean, that's how life ideally works, right? And so I'm grateful for men like Al who are, you know, 20 something years ahead of me and, and have, are, are guiding me, you know, and I think there are men 20 years behind me, you know, similarly speaking. But he's got two podcasts. One of them is called The Briefing, which um, is daily, except for it takes a month off. And um, it's, it's a routine of mine, personally, and, and many more. Um, in fact, so much so that when he doesn't come on, I get nervous that he's, had, he's gotten sick or something, you know, because one time it did, and my heart sank, and I began to pray for him. Uh, and so he actually, last week, it went on late, and he had to tweet that, um, to all of those who are worried about my health, it's okay, I'm fine. It was just a, it was a, bl- a bug, you know, we all breathe a sigh of relief. But he also has a, on a podcast called Thinking in Public, and I want to commend this one to you, particularly if you're interested, as he interviewed a sociologist named James Davidson Hunter, who I have also known since college, or at least intellectually, I've never met him, he's at UVA, and he wrote a book um, called Culture Wars, which in large part had to do with the, um, the fracturing of American society along quote-unquote religious lines with the focal point being abortion. And this was back in the early 80s. 
uh, because you remember abortion um, really wasn't a, target, a topic of real discussion um, in and amongst uh, the populace until Roe versus Wade, I mean, um, yeah, Roe versus Wade forced it upon people whether they wanted it or not. And so all of a sudden you had people who were um, all, you know, woken up to the fact that, wait a minute, um, you know, I, I wasn't really that interested or really aware for that matter. I mean, this is well before the internet and things, you know, what was going on in, in San Francisco or Vermont or New Hampshire, but we're here we're in Baton Rouge, you know, we have our own little lives. And then, and then it, was, it, was, it was thrust into the national stage. And to be frank, um, the Roman Catholics were much more uh, consistent and rich in their theological defense for the unborn than the Protestants were at that point. Um, you'll have people on record like former leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention and others who were uh, making this spurious and erroneous argument that the uh, child is not a human until it was born, right? Talking about uh, various points along development where the soul would enter and before then it was okay to kill. You'll, you'll hear these arguments and you should, as my old theology professor said, reach for your holsters, you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and, and just sort of say, excuse me, what did you say again? Um, the problem is many of you don't have bullets to put in the guns that you would be reaching for, so that's what you're here for right now, okay? So um, that's part of the problem. But suffice it to say, the Roman Catholics in their long tradition of what we say natural law theology, which considered the, the, the amazing miracle of God's creative uh, uh, action in the world, most notably with men and women, which the high watermark of that, in my opinion, is John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which I do not recommend to you because it is incredibly long and very dense and hard to read. What I do recommend is to you uh, is Matthew West wrote a distillation of it, which is very accessible, which I forgot the name of now, Google it, I'll put it out there for you, um, where, he, where he, he digests it for you. But suffice it to say, it was in the late 70s when Roe vs. Roe Wade came on the scene that everyone began talking about abortion. And why was abortion such a big deal? Well, it is not a political question. It has political ramifications, but it is first and foremost a metaphysical uh, question, meaning beyond phusis, beyond the created world. You know, there is no way of deciding when life begins other than having a commitment that is greater and beyond the quote-unquote science, which is what we call metaphysics, right? Which, is a, which has always been the realm of philosophy and particularly religion, okay? So all of a sudden, everyone became a metaphysician in America because they were forced to make a decision. Is this good or bad news? Well, how do you know? Why do you think that? What is your argument? And of course, before we had ultrasound and before we had color TV and before we had all sorts of things, it was harder to, it was easier to deny that it was in fact a child. So you're like, well, I don't know, you know, quickening. Remember that was the old way of like, you know, when, and you didn't even know you were pregnant until you were, and, and just to disabuse yourself of, my gosh, I'm going all over the place now. I'm thinking of, of Kinsey, Albert Kinsey, and who was a demon-possessed man um, who uh, will have a lot to answer for. You may know this. He's the one who did all of the sex research, uh, including on actual children, which we've now found out. Um, and he was the one who gave into the world this myth that somehow before 1940 or 50, um, nobody knew how sex worked. Do you remember this? Which was one of the main arguments for introducing sex, quote-unquote, education into the public schools, because he was among the people saying, look, if we don't teach these three and four-year-olds how their babies are made, then they're going to just keep thinking they come from storks, right? Well, if you have, know any farmers in your life, you know that, that um, we, we've known it hasn't come from storks for a long time, you know? Um, but if you want to make that argument, your nefarious real reason for, doing, for sexualizing children at a young age is to break down morality, have a new metaphysic implanted in them, and therefore ultimately um, perpetuate the lie which Satan loves that did God really say. This is, again, there's a lot packed into that little statement right there, but suffice it to say, um, back to this conversation. James Davidson Hunter wrote a book in the early 80s called Culture Wars, which was from the German Kulturkampf, um, which they had obviously been wrestling with uh, for decades longer, um, because he recognized that this was not gonna go away. This was not gonna go away because the question put before you by the question of abortion is a metaphysical question which you will answer with your every thought. You know, every, every time you drive past a, 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 um, a, uh, a graveyard, you are confronted by the question, a metaphysical question of God, of death, heaven, hell, reality, and you're answering that just in the same way you're answering whether or not that's a child or not, right? And so the easiest way to answer there's no reason to fear that grave is to also say there's no way that can be a child. 
because there cannot be a God, because a God would perhaps bring me to judgment, and if I go to judgment, then, well, I know what I've done, and even though my best friend says everything I've done is okay, um, I'm still worried about that every now and then, because I, uh, my, my, my fourth son from my third marriage really doesn't like me very much, and I'm worried about that, right? And so what do we do about all of it? What we do about all of it is we deny it, and we reject it, and we, we try to silence those who, who remind us of it. You know how this is. It's like, it's like the people that love to go to their 40th high school reunion, you know, and uh, it's because they're the ones who like have, you know, have all their hair, you know, are still, still married, like haven't, you know, destroyed their lives. And then it's the people that have destroyed their lives don't show up. Why? Well, because they don't want to be reminded of what could have been and what should have been. Well, this is all wrapped together in the question of abortion, I would suggest to you, because people who argue that it is the science are lying because there is no more clear and dedicated uh, uh, scientific reality than, than the creation of unique DNA, which we didn't know about 10, 12 years ago, because we, had, we hadn't decoded it yet. Creation of unique, distinct DNA at the moment of fertilization, which we have no other way of determining what is a human being other than the fact that they have unique and distinct DNA. And that takes place instantaneously. We, you can actually can video it, you can watch it. And guess what else happens at that moment? An explosion of light. I mean, you know, who would have thought that let there be life and there would be an explosion of light? So if someone tells you it's a scientific argument, you can listen to them and smile, but know that you are in a boxing match with someone who is just jabbing you because they are just trying to keep you at arm's length because it is not a scientific argument. It's a metaphysical argument. It's a faith-based argument, and that's why the fight has only gotten worse. So. James Abson Hunter wrote the first book, Culture uh, Wars, which I, I don't think I even own, but I was aware of, and I've read a lot of articles about it, so that's where you are. I'm just not going to uh, uh, pretend that I've read it. But the second one is called Before the Shooting Starts, which I also have not read, um, but I have listened to it a lot, but I know someone who has. Um, and, uh, but it was, again, about abortion, because he saw that, well, of all the questions that are confronting humanity in the American, American world uh, right now, um, that the logic of the pro and contra abortion arguments could lead, could lead to an actual battles, you know? And you say, well, how could that possibly be? Well, you could have lived uh, two, five miles from Dachau, for instance, back in 1940. Or maybe outside, maybe you could have driven past Auschwitz on the way to your ski holiday, and you might wonder, you might be a little bit more aware of how you possibly could have been convinced that you should take up arms if those people in that camp were real humans. Well, if those people in those freezers, those embryos are real humans, if those people that are being chill, killed are real humans, you might possibly consider how somebody could get to the point where they would take up arms. Now, I'm not, please, I'm not suggesting that, um, if, but, I can, I can hear that argument and I can pray and I can do what I can legally and peacefully to, um, to, to stop this atrocity, which is, what I, which is what I do as best I can. I mean, but at any rate, he was just talking about all this. So this, this final book that just came out, which I am reading, so I can say this, I do own audio and the, the, the other ones, the hardback's coming. This is coming. And what was sort of depressing, I'm gonna warn you, is that he sounds defeated. He sounds that things have gotten worse, things have, um, the division has grown, there doesn't seem to be any uh, crossing the divide, and Lord have mercy on us all. And so that was a little, I'm just warning you, but it, there's a lot of words in between there. And, um, you know, I think he's a believer, but he's not a believer, he's not a theologian by trade, and he's not a preacher, so he didn't like, Al sort of pulled us out of the nosedive, you know, at the end. Um, but I was grateful for it, because I was sitting there, I was like, well, and when, when's the, the last chapter, you know, he says, and so in, in light of all this, this is what we should do. And so I was listening to this, and I, it was, and I was reading the book, and I was, had been living through a lot of, you know, I was, I was what, I was 10 years old, I guess, when he wrote his first book, um, so I wasn't reading it then, but it was very shortly after that I was getting involved. I mean, some of my earliest uh, childhood memories, in fact, are uh, marching with my parents in the Right to Life marches in downtown Baton Rouge, like some of my earliest ones. Um, and I remember there was a bunch of crosses put out uh, for the dead babies, and somebody had come overnight and put coat hangers over all the crosses, and I was very confused as to why that happened. And my mom was trying to explain to me, well, this is what they think will happen if this, that, or the other, and it was very formative. But it's been part of, and I'm not alone, you know, this is the issue of our time, precisely, like I said before, because it's not political. It will be politicized, but it's because it's a metaphysical, like, is there a God? 
That's what I was preaching about. You know, just one, just one long sermon. You just come in and out of different parts of it in my life is really how that happens. Um, so I commend that to you. But why do I say all that? Well, uh, this is the book, Democracy and Solidarity. Uh, these two books read together, and I gave this one away a couple weeks ago, and somebody read it and gave it back to me, but I've forgotten it. These two books together will make you sort of depressed. Um, but you have to know where you are in order to know where you want to go, right? It's what I was preaching about today. So it doesn't do any good to say, well, I wish that the other, we, we should have done otherwise. But here we are. And we're in a world where we are deeply fractured in our society, in our American society, because we don't have a shared what's called uh, culture. What I mean by that, you know, culture is a collection of, of uh, as James Davidson Hunter would say, a collection of be shared beliefs about what is good, the beautiful, and the true, right? That doesn't mean that you have to hold them all uh, equally or that you even uh, would articulate them in the exact same way, but it sort of predates politics, it predates your life. Like there's a, there's a you know, you, you have a shared culture in a nation when you think despite our failures, we are in fact a good nation, you know? And if you think you're a bad nation, well, you might want to actually leave when you threaten to, you know? Um, you, you, do you know what's genuinely beautiful about, um, about your body, you know, about your, your, the, the way that you've been formed? Not that you think you're the most beautiful, but you think that it's good to be a man, for instance, good to be a woman. You think that children are a blessing or a curse. You have these ideas, and if you, if you have a collection of people that share them together, well, then they form a culture, and out of culture comes art and uh, architecture and music and philosophy and all the things, right? So it's unsurprising that when you have a culture, for instance, like Le Cabassier in the communist culture, right? There is no God. Uh, people are to be subjugated and brutalized. And so what do we see is the architectural sort of birthing from that cultural mindset? These giant, massive concrete structures that are intended to scare you and to frighten you and to show you exactly where your place in life is, right? Now you take that, compare it to, I haven't been to the, um, to the chapel out at Palmetto Hall, but apparently it's a beautiful uh, picture of integration of, of faith and nature, right? Is this fair to say? Now that's a totally different idea, right? So we want to build one right here, just stay tuned, right in the middle here, sort of a little smaller version of it right in the middle. But you know, that would be an emanation of a different culture, for instance, right? So why do I say all that? Because we've got some work to do. You have some work to do. We have work to do, but it's not in vain. Not in vain, because think about who you were before you believed as much as you do now, and think about that person and, and pray for the person who you think that when it comes up, and then think about what it would be like if you believed more, if you were more articulate, more um, courageous, more confident, um, and, and that's a hope set before you. You know, and I'm with you here, you know? I mean, I'm, and I'm, I'm further ahead. I mean, they don't call us, thankfully. Well, they call a lot of faithless people to the ministry, actually, um, which is why the churches, some of the churches are in the way they are. But I'm grateful we're not among those two or three. Um, but as I'll preach about again today, that comes at a hard work. You know, we'll do some of it for you. I mean, you have to, you know, you, when I go into a doctor's office, I assume that the doctor has done a lot more reading about whatever it is going on with me than I have. Uh, but I've read a little bit about it to know enough to choose that doctor, right? You know, and so that's kind of how we are with this. So, okay, I'm going to pull it back in. So here we go. What does this have to do? Well, I love Ryan Burge. I've subscribed to him. You don't have to. He does the, uh, I don't know him as a person, but he has really, there's obviously more people out there like me than, than I'd like to believe, because he says there's a lot of people who read statistics and don't really digest them, so I'm going to put them in graph form, as I've said, and they're going to be easier to read. And so I'm like, sign me up. How much does this cost? Well, this has an end. The God gap in American politics. He says there, if there's one catchphrase, and he's a sociologist like James Davidson Hunter, not as, not as uh, renowned, but there's, if there's, read it slowly, <laughs> okay, if there's, one catchphrase in my little corner of the social science world, it's the God gap. It's the simple idea that the Republicans have become the party of religious folks while the Democrats are much less religiously inclined. And this is, I hope, this is not exactly a political statement, although we, you know, there, there is, but, it, well, I'm just going to keep going. How this happened exactly is still a matter of fierce debate among political scientists, sociologists, and historians. But the upshot of all this is the same. The modern Republican Party is a whole lot more religious than the modern Democratic Party. That's all I want to do today is to make that evidence clear, not really come up with my own explanation for why this is the case. Well, I would have present to you that as it stands now, when you go back to our metaphysical conundrum about the question of when does life begin, 
and you politicize that in the form of whether you should be pro or anti-abortion, and then you lay over that two questions, one party over another, well then, as you continue to profess a belief in God, so you will side with one metaphysical question over against the other. Therefore, the people who are pro-abortion are more democratic, or Democrats, and the people who are anti-abortion are Republicans. That's what I would suggest to you. Much more complicated than that, like everything else. But it's not, it's not less complicated. Than the, I mean, if that makes, you know, this is part of, part of the issue. And I'll show you why this is the case in here. So I've written elsewhere, religion is conceived to run on three dimensions. Belief this is measured in a variety of ways, including a view of the Bible, belief in angels, demons, God, heaven, hell, etc. Behavior, this is almost always measured by religious attendance. And belonging, this is what group you identify with on a survey. So let me visualize how the two major parties have diverged on these metrics over the past couple of decades. Let's start with a belief in God, a question that has been included in the general sur social survey with regularity since the early 1990s. Now, I'm going to go through this, and my intention is to, well, let me just see if I can, if I can do it. So let's look at belief first. What do you believe about God? 1990s, Democrat, Republican, um, don't believe is a very small percentage. Um, no way to find out, 10%, or a small percentage. Some higher power, 10%, um, believe sometimes, 16%, believe but doubts, 63%, and believe no doubts. I think those two are the last. Believe but doubts and believe no doubts. But you look at that, that is an overwhelming percentage, either believe but doubts or believe no doubts. Now, just put a pin in the believe no doubts, because you might think that that contradicts my sermon today, but it doesn't. But, but at any rate, that's quite a change from 2020, and that's just 30 years, right? Uh, most of us here, with few exceptions, have lived through this. Um, you have uh, the Republicans in 2020, 63% say believe, no doubts. Put an asterisk there, we're gonna talk about that. 19% say believe, but doubts. And so you see an overwhelming majority have some belief in God, if not a higher power, right? Well, if you believe in a higher power and you believe that your vote will contribute to the either life or death of an actual human being, well, then you may vote differently than if you don't, right? You just may. It doesn't, it doesn't necessitate that you will, um, but you just might. And you just, in fact, do, for the most part. This is what happens. But look at, look at the Democrats. 2020, 39% um, believe but no doubt, 17%. So you still have over 50% have believe but doubts, believe but no doubts, but that is quite a change from 1990. Right, okay? So let's just stick with that. That's belief. Remember the three categories, belief, behavior, belonging, okay? So that's belief. So the behavior, remember he says behavior in sociological terms is always associated on how often you participate in the life of the church. Well, in 1970, you had um, weekly was 36% and monthly was 16%. Now, I thought this was sort of interesting. Yearly is somehow more than seldom. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. If you go to church yearly, I would say that you seldom go to church. I would not make a distinction between those two. And in fact, if you seldom go to church, which is less than yearly, then I would basically say you never go to church. And, but instead, that's also a category here. So I don't know what... Um, Anyway, that's, that's very technical, because I would, I, would, I would beg to differ with the, with the guy that puts this up. At any rate, I assume they ask the same questions. 1970s, you see that, all the way to 2020, you have weekly at 32%, which I was heartened to see. Now, as an aside, what that points to, and I have other graphs to show you this, is that all of this discussion about, um, you know, well, for instance, most notably, that the divorce rate within the church is the same outside of the church, that's a lie. That's a lie if you actually look at something this granular, like how many, when you say you go to church, they would be lumping people who are divorced into those who say they seldom go to church, which is less than yearly. So if you take that as your, your, um, your uh, sort of study group, well then yes, the divorce rate would be indiscriminate from non-Christians because people who go to church seldom, meaning less than it yearly, then are indiscriminate from non-Christians in the first place. Because that means you went on like a funeral, you know, or you went because they had a, they had a, a concert or your, or your niece was, was, was getting confirmed and that's why you went to church, right? Well, you are not in the same category, sociologically speaking, as people who have gone weekly. If you dig down that deeply, you'll see that people, people who go weekly to church, um, who say that they read their Bible, who pray, and I've got a whole book, I've got a stack of these books actually called The Good of Marriage by a woman named Shanti Feldman. 
um, who was a sociologist who was teaching this statistic, and like a good sociologist that your PhD program scares you into doing, uh, she went and tried to find the hard data before she taught it, you know? This is one of the, I think Sam, the whole reason people get PhDs, so they don't misspeak, or at least they don't say without a footnote. Um, and she went to try to track it down, and it turns out it was some study done, um, you know, one time, not replicable by a now debate, a debunked, quote unquote, scholar that, um, that, that has never been replicated. You know, sociological studies that are not at least um, uh, replicated or at least replicatable, they don't have uh, uh, studies and all the things, um, are not particularly well, um, uh, uh, they're not commended unless they say what you want it to say. And it's very important for people outside the church to say that, that God is not real and church makes no difference in your life. It's important for people to be able to say that so that they can go run past this church on Sunday when they're on vacation, right? I mean, which they do all the time, you know? And I like running too, but you, know, you can stop by. You know? That's why our chapel is going to be important anyway. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, so that was an aside. But you look at this, is that there's a, quite a change there. So you had uh, yearly... 28% um, in 1970, and that's down to 22 for the Democrats, uh, but the seldom, which as we know is less than yearly, um, has risen from 8 to 14, but the big number obviously never from 13% to 35%. So you put 35 and 14, that's half of the people who go less than yearly, plus 22, so you're looking at 70% plus people in the Democratic Party who go to church yearly, or less than yearly, um, and that would be how you would, you would dive into this, what do you believe about God? So there's lots of people that believe in God still, 50% of the people believe in God, but have doubts, some of them, but they're not getting their beliefs about God, at least not by their own attestation. So where are they getting their beliefs from? Well, go to Barnes & Noble, and you'll find out. You know, they're getting their, their, their reading astrology charts, they're praying with Ouija boards, they're re reading tarot cards. I mean, there are people who have, you know, I, I don't go to these parties, I don't get invited anymore, but I know parties where people have tarot card readers as part of like the fun and excitement of their, of their, their rave, you know? Um, and so this is just un undeniable here. That there's a lot of people who believe in God not getting their understanding of God from church. Well, what does this have to do? What is your present religion? Um, Protestant, Catholic, no religion, something else. In 1970, Democrats, were Protestant or Catholic, overwhelmingly so, or no religion, very small, 1970, right? Well, fast forward to 2020, you have 32% Protestant, 21% Catholic, so that's half of the people who are uh, professing um, sort of some religion, um, and then you have, but you have 34%, more than um, half, or 34% or something else, right? So something else. Um, and then you have the Republicans here. So what is all this saying? Well, remember, these are the same people who, over here, how often you attend religious services. So you know churches, not this one, but you know churches and you know people who consider themselves members of, let's say, a Catholic church, who go less than yearly, so they, go, they seldom go, right? But they are, they are members in good standing, or they think they are, of this church over here. And you know people, we have people on our, on our list, and none of you, but we have people that I've never met who I guarantee you if I met them and I didn't tell them who I was and I said, I go to St. Luke's, they'd be like, me too. I guarantee you. And I've been here over two years now. Um, I know this for a fact, that one of the churches I served many, many churches ago, um, I would introduce myself to people and they would say, oh yeah, I got married there. That's my church. And I was like, I'm the rector. You know, I've been the rector for four years. I was like, I've never met you. Um, and they were not even embarrassed. Not even, they'd be like, oh yeah, that's great. Well, yeah. I don't know, we used to go more, you know, when the kids are little, you know, that sort of thing. And so, but, so he seldom goes, I guess. That, there we go, they seldom go. Um, it's like, well, you're going to end up at a church, one, at, well, maybe not a church, but you're going to, um, well, anyway, someday you're going to go back in, um, just might not, you know, to be visited as opposed to visit, right? That's the, uh, the old saying. So what do we say about all that? Well, James, we're going to talk about James, because what I want to submit to you is this, is that the created reality of our lives in the image of God uh, means that we have no choice but to worship. We really have no choice to deny the spiritual things of the world. And even what we're seeing, the end of this lie of sort of uh, what they used to call scientific materialism, you know, there was a, what's fascinating about this is that the, the, the people that, that glommed on to, um, to sort of the materialistic world, there is no um, God, you know, we're just atoms or whatever. Some of the philosophers and science, scientists thought that was a, um, you know, sort of, a, a, a sort of intellectual, ideological idea. 
But on a ground level basis, all that allowed people to do was do whatever they want without supposedly being judged for it. That's why it was such, so, so it was actually a spiritual sort of um, uh, uh, reality. I'm reading a book again right now called Monsters from the Id. It talks about the, the French Revolution and sort of the beginnings of modern horror fiction. And one of his arguments is that when we try to deny the image of God in our lives by saying, there is no God, I can do whatever I want. Well, you can say that, but it's not true. And what remains is your soul. And when your soul, and when you do whatever you want without any regards for God or for his design for your soul, you're going to hurt yourself and others. And when you hurt yourself and others, because we're designed in the image of God, you're going to begin to feel what's called guilt and shame. And then you're going to suppress this guilt and shame by arguing louder and louder that there is no reason to be guilty, there's no reason to be ashamed, and then you're going to try to silence those people who make you feel that you think, namely the church, and all the while, your lives are going to be um, sort of slowly falling apart. And there's a book I want to commend to you called Intellectuals by a man named Philip Johnson. And he will describe to you in detail how all of these great philosophers who had these wonderful ideas about how life would be good and true and beautiful without God, in their own lives, they were train wrecks would be a nice way of putting it. Um, monstrous um, sort of diabolical maniacs would be another way. I mean, Rousseau, most famously, you know, had four children, I think by four different women, all of whom he abandoned, you know. Um, the, the hero of the French Revolution ultimately was beheaded, but nevertheless, you know, and he was one of the great, he's still one of the, and you get this from Carl Truman's book, still one of the shining stars of, of American pedagogical uh, theory, um, even though it's been debunked, because the alternative, back to our binary, is that, well, if he was wrong about God, then maybe, uh, maybe he was wrong about all sorts of things, but maybe I should consider the question of God. And that cannot be, that's a non-starter for most people. So why does this come into it? Well, I'm not going to read this whole thing from James, but I wanted to, uh, uh, this is from our reading today. Um, so James is talking to a group of people who did not have the same problems in a certain sense as we do today, because he was writing to, um, to, to uh, his church or to believers or people who are wrestling with belief um, in God, most notably Jesus in the flesh becoming, um, you know, is, is, is the king. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a different context than just your, your base atheist. But nevertheless, what was happening, as you heard in our reading today, is that people were saying, well, I can just believe, and now that Jesus has been risen, I can just believe and, um, and, and evidently not do anything at all, you know, which would have been an early heresy and a persistent heresy, you know, of this, well, I can just, me and my Bible at home, I can believe and, you know, um, and, and there, there's been no effect on my life. And so that's an, an error, but an equal error, as we pointed out today, is to do things thinking that would in fact save you. You know, well, I'm a good person, I'm a member of this church, you know, I'm on the vestry, you know, I'm a, I give a lot of money, which we support, I'm just kidding, but, the, uh, but, I, uh, you know, but that's what's saving me. It's like, well, that doesn't save you either. It's faith alone which saves. But one of the things that James knew, which the Bible per, uh, perpetuates, is that saving faith i.e. knowledge of having been saved by God in Christ for sinners, has no choice but to emanate into works because you will now walk as, um, as a, well, as, as Jesus himself says, as one born again. As Paul says, one crucified and raised. There's no choice but to walk as someone now different than you were before, and that's because you don't have a knowledge of God in general, but you have a knowledge of God in specific, which is his death on a cross for you. Which means that when you talk about God, when we talk about the divine, which I don't suggest, but when we talk about higher power, again, don't suggest that, um, because those are, those are sort of vaguely frightening and uh, culturally unoffensive ways to talk about Lord Jesus Christ, right? To talk about my Savior, to talk about having been redeemed and forgiven. These are very specific ways of talking about God, which, which are the ways that people who have no choice but to work their faith out talk. Because you cannot talk about the, the hope of heaven and the reality of redemption without, um, without looking at the, the poor, the lost, and the needy, the unborn, and having your heart broken for them. You just can't. Now, you might have seasons where you're calloused and not. And what we do, you know, I have so many metaphors for what we do in church, but one of them I'm just thinking, you know, we're like, we're like the, 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 the pedic pedicure person that's like rough, smoothing the calluses off you, you know. It's like this is what we're doing. That's kind of a gross one to think about. But anyway, um, but, you know, your hardened heart, you know, what do we do? We, 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 we pray for the softening of the heart, the, the changing of the mind, and the uh, renewal of the strengthening of your will. You know, that's what we pray for. 
each and every day. You know, that's why I pray for myself. You know, because as, as Ashley Knoll has coined the phrase, the human person makes a decision thusly. What the heart desires, the mind justifies, and then the will enacts, right? This Ashley, he was, he's going to come be with us in February, so he'll say it himself. But this is a wonderful way of understanding the problem with you. Is that whatever you want in your heart, you know, you want health, wealth, you want well, wealth, pleasure, um, you know, whatever that wants, you will justify in your mind. You know, like my secretary, you know, the classic example, um, you know, she gets me, you know, she, my wife never really uh, understood my, my want to be an artist. You know, she, and in fact, now the more I think about it, she really um, is quite an unpleasant person. And, you know, and then the more I think about it, the more I think about it, the more I really think that, that the way I should go is to Vegas with my secretary and not stay home with my wife and six kids, you know? The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced, and guess what happens then? Your will just decides to get on the airplane and go. And just insert your, insert hypothetical dramatic situation that has, in fact, taken place in many people's lives there. And you see how this works. So what do we pray about? We pray for heart transplants, where all of a sudden you can say, well, you know, I have this desire, but it's been tempered by my new heart, however stone still beginning to beat, and my mind is being renewed by the scriptures, thou shalt not, thou shalt, all the various things, and so as my heart begins to beat and begins to feel, then my mind being renewed and refreshed begins to think along the right direction, and then I actually don't buy the ticket to Vegas. Right? In fact, because I never really considered it because I actually feel very um, humble that some woman would stick this long with me in the first place. That's a totally different way of thinking, which is true, actually. Honestly, thank you. Um, but anyway, um, this is what James is talking about. He's talking, he's not arguing, as the Roman Catholics and the Protestant polemicists, polemicists for that matter, are trying to pit the Bible against each other, rip it apart. Because the Bible is clear, you will do what you believe in. That's what the Bible is clear about. If you believe that there is no God, you will act accordingly. If you believe that God will reward only the good, pious, and the holy, well, then you will act accordingly. You might be a better human being than others, but you will miss entirely the message of Jesus. You know, if you believe that, you, um, that, that you know, your actions do not have consequences, you will act accordingly, and so on and so forth. If you think the most important thing in life is education, you will, you will invest all your money there. If you think it's, if you think it's, it's um, you know, avoiding pain and pursuing pleasure, I mean, again, just whatever it is, you will live by faith, and Christians live by faith in the one who has laid down his life for them. It's the Apostle Paul. I have been crucified with Christ, right, in Galatians 2.20. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the one who gave himself for me. Well, that's the the clarion call of the church, right? And that's why it changes everything. And so, as I've said before, a life of legalism, a life of of working out your salvation in fear of, uh, in unbelieving fear, can look very similarly to the free life of grace. And so, you know, you could both be on the vestry together. And one of you is like, well, I hope this gets me in. And the other one is, I can't believe they take people like me here. <laughs> but here we are. You know, you could be giving 10% of your, your, your money away because you say, well, you know, if there is a God, I hope he appreciates that. And the, and the rest of you could say, you know, the widows might. You could say, well, if I had more, I would. You know, they're the same person sitting next to each other. And so our goal, we won't really be able to, to tell the difference except that one comes with joy and one comes with gritted teeth and clenched fingers, right? And so, again, um, I can't really, and sometimes it's not even that obvious. So this is where you have to pray. Again, I'm just priming you for the sermon. If you already heard it, this is a sermon part two. If you haven't heard it, this is the preamble to the sermon. So either way, it works. But if you pray along these lines, um, he is faithful to hear your prayers. You know, pray for a soft heart. You know, pray for a, pray for a, a, a quickening of your conscience. You know, and these are scary prayers. You know, if you get pricked consciences about things that you didn't used to care about, you start caring about them, you start, you know, you, you, you start doing things, you know? Like, I mean, prison reform, for instance. I love the Allendale prison we have. If I were running for office, I would run on, I would be an anti-abortion candidate, and I would be a total revolution of the prison system. Um, because if you, if the, the brutality, you know, civilizations are marked by how we treat our prisoners, if we treat them at all. And some of the things that these men endure after having already been taken their freedoms away is unconscionable, you know? But that's a prick of a conscience that I never had when I was younger. I was like, you know, throw them away and, you know, throw away the key, you know? And so I'm, I'm worried about where that's going to lead, right? 
But there we go. Lord, come down. Soften your heart. Rip off the, the scabs of, of indifference and, and continue to quicken your conscience. As your heart is softened, your mind will be renewed, and then your wills will be put to service. And so that's where we are with that. Because these are the alternatives, and I'll leave you with this, is that when someone talks about God, I want to just encourage you, ask questions. Like, what are you talking about? Like, when you say, when you say the universe, what do you mean? Like, let's just, I mean, you know, try to be, I, I, I've been fairly good at this in my life, even though I, I'm a priest, is, is really saying, like, look, I'm honestly just asking. Like, I'm not trying to get in a fight with you. I've got, you know my ideas, not interested, but I'm just curious. Like, you know, how is that helping you out? Like, what's that, that um, you know, what do you, d- does that astrology card actually explain things to you? How does this work? I mean, you'll be able to, because what happens is we begin to get perjured by our own unbelief in false idols because people don't actually believe this. They just don't yet believe what they should. And so when you get them to, to start talking nonsense, which is what all of this idolatrous pagan worship is, then they will say it, but it will hang out there and ultimately, ult- and I've seen this, drive them to perhaps an actual book or a church or, I mean, maybe a mosque or a, or a temple. I mean, something more real, which will be in service of bringing them to their knees before the Lord. That's my, that, that is how this works. And so, again, it's not a, we don't have, we're not voodoo, we don't have chicken bones we can throw out and make sure it works, um, which it doesn't work, but we have the spirit, we have the confidence of our own and the joy of our own salvation, and we have the promise that God will, will work through the feeble attempts of your own um, ever-strengthening hands and knees um, to bring people to the saving knowledge of Him. So, I'm going to um, leave it there. Oh, why did I do this? Oh, yes. This is my, I'll leave you with this. This is near and dear, this whole faith and works thing for me. And I, wanted, I did write a book. You can't buy it anymore. If any of you have a copy, I would buy it back from you, actually, because I'm, um, I'm trying to find some copies. I think I'm just going to print it myself on like, um, Amazon. But I want you to uh, just hear this final statement, because I thought it would just sum up the whole faith versus works, the whole preaching versus non-preaching, belief and unbelief. Just to read this. This is the last chapter of my whole book. For proponents of retaining an emphasis on the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the doctrine upon which the church stands or fall. The human being is understood to be one who is fundamentally a hearer. Bayer explains, hearers and readers of the biblical text are interpreted within the church, within the community of those who first hear and believe and only then speak, I believe and so I speak. Consequently, to those who are being addressed by creation as the law, as the address of the hidden God, quote, clothed in majesty, the address of the gospel of a illicit confession found in Ephesians, that is, quote, by grace you have been saved through faith. However, those who argue that this confession alone will not sufficiently motivate or inspire Christians towards, quote, good works, reveal through this argument their conceptual failure to grasp the way in which the two are related. Good works, this sanctification, are the fruit of a living tree and the movements of a healthy, uh, a healthy person. Faith without works is dead, we were reminded, so Ferdy says, quite true. But then what follows is usually some long and dreary description of works and what we should be about, as though the way to revive a dead faith were by putting up a good works front. If the faith is dead, it's the faith that must be revived. No amount of works will do it. And this is me. This is why the distinction between law and gospel must be maintained, because the problem that besets human beings as the homo peccator, the sinful human, is not ultimately a lack of works, but a lack of faith. When this is seen as the fundamental problem, the theological task is necessarily driven towards proclaiming the gospel, the good news, that God has come to his creatures in mercy, forgiveness, and love, and that the terrors that assault the conscience have been addressed once for all on the cross. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord, be with us now. Continue to strengthen, well, continue to soften our hearts. Continue to renew our minds and continue to strengthen our will. All for your glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, see you all next I won't be here. I'm speaking at a conference next week. Liza and I are speaking at a family conference. Um, but Kelly will be here, your, your, your faithful guide. Thank you.